crazy. I just love you all. Like, I just am so fascinated by sellers. And that's a big part of why I enjoy sales enablement as much as I do. True. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, sellers get a lot of attention and sales leaders get a lot of attention, but sure. I don't know how much of that is really authentic gratitude. You know, like recognition and gratitude are not exactly the same thing. True. And, and yeah. so, I mean, my, my real heartbeat for sellers starts with thank you for my paycheck, <laughs> like straight up. No, like I, I would not I have a that. career I and a paycheck without it, without sellers and without sales leaders. I like that perspective. Um, and so as kind of an, a formal welcome, Phil, welcome <laughs> to the podcast. Welcome Thank to Voices you. of Enablement. So excited to have you on. And I want to dissect this topic a little bit more, obviously, over the next 30 minutes or so. Yeah. And really that topic is we're in a recession or whatever you want to call it. Not a, not quite a recession, but it's there. It's looming. Sure. Something's, something, something's happening. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it's not ideal. And people are losing their jobs or people are struggling to find a job. And yeah. Enablement is unfortunately getting the short end of the stick in a lot of those scenarios. And I think it's because exactly like you said, a lot of the times it's seen as more of a cost center. Um, and so we wanted to a set this time aside to be a little like therapy kind of. <laughs> I got that. Uh, Cause I think, <laughs> I think there's room for that. Uh, it yeah. needs to happen. Um, but then also, is there a tactical way for this profession to elevate itself? And if yeah. so, how so? And so, Again, thanks for thanks for coming on. If you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself, um, and then we'll we'll dive into the topic a little bit more. Sure. Hi, I'm Phil Putnam, and I'm a Leo who loves to laugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, gosh, okay, I'll tell you about my job, but I'll tell you about myself first because that's always just I always like to start with the humanity of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've done a lot of different types of work in my career. I've kind of taken the the really long way uh, to enablement leadership. Um, but there are two things that have been consistent or been, been consistent, not inconsistent, <laughs> two things that have been consistent throughout all of the jobs I've done. Um, I'm a caretaker. I just love taking care of people. There's really nothing that brings me greater satisfaction than that. And then also I'm obsessed with communication. And so those two things found a very happy home totally. within the world of enablement. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've done all different types of functional enablement, uh, both just informally as special project work within various roles I've had. And then also like officially sales enablement as well as like CSM enablement. And um, it's that it's that fascination and passion for sellers that particularly makes sales enablement my my favorite home. Um, you know, and I, I just love conversation. I love to listen. So in terms of therapy, yeah, I'm basically a therapist that just didn't want to go to grad school. <laughs> so I got a bachelor's in music instead and then worked in music for a while, ran my own PR firm for a while. Cool. And then, you know, I, I basically, I moved to New York from, from Sacramento, California, where I'm originally from. And uh, eventually I needed a big boy job with a big boy salary because it's expensive in Manhattan. Yeah. And so um, there was a, at the time, Sprinkler, which is a pretty, pretty large uh, tech company now, they were like an early stage startup. I was employee wow. 36 at Sprinkler. Crazy. And so that was my entry, you know, into the SaaS tech world and, and really cut my teeth in a lot of really helpful ways, a lot of insane ways. Um, and uh and that really founded a lot of my, my career in tech. And so uh, things have just sort of flowed forward from that point. Um, I'm still a little bit in awe of, of what I'm allowed to do, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I still, too. yeah, I'm like, this is a thing. I, this is a thing <laughs> that there's a name for and people pay for. Um, but I get, to, I get to take care of my sellers and sales leaders and I get to bring... Um, the behavioral and skills components, the, the recommendations on the executive level, and then also the execution that covers the, the, the behavior and skills components of a success strategy. And that just makes me so happy. I love it. Uh, well, mm -hmm. We're excited to have you. Um, glad you landed into this just as much <laughs> as I'm sure you are glad you landed in it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure your sellers are glad you landed in it. Um, I think I love, they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I love that you prefaced with, I'm a caretaker. 
Yeah. And I love to communicate. I think those two are probably, if you could pick two of the best, I don't know, like properties of a good enabler, I would say those yeah. are probably two of the top for sure. Yeah, so absolutely. I think that's well said. That, that genuine desire to actually contribute. And I got to be honest, I don't think that's hard for most enablers. Most enablers I know, that is just who they are. Yeah, they're but doers for sure. They're not only doers, but they're they're caretakers. And yeah. so um, I think that that is a huge part of our power and our value to an organization. I also think it's a large part of what makes some relationships between enablement and the business unit leaders that we serve difficult. Mm, we're going to unpack that. I yeah, like that. That's a little Yeah, we, yeah we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's good. So let's get into it then. Let's start a more high level broad strokes sure. and then we're going to get into those details. Uh, so let's start with kind of back to the topic, recession-ish thing. Yeah. People are struggling to find jobs or people currently in jobs are struggling to kind of keep their jobs or like you said, they're scared right now. What yeah. the heck is going to happen? How do we elevate enablement or how does that one person let's take it even a little, a little more tactical how does that one person in that role elevate what enablement means in their organization obviously there's out, outside factors but sure how do they elevate themselves to be less of a cost center supportive role and much more of a strategic function totally well i think there are a lot of different components to this conversation and there's one particular yes. component i can probably contribute the most value on and that is to say that um there's got to be at least three things present for a value assessment to be made. There obviously has to be the data, the information. Mm -hmm. There has to be a measurement framework, and there has to be a context. We hear it all the time. Data only means something in context. Mm -hmm. Another way people express that is to say, but what's the story? Yeah. What story is this data telling? And I, I'll be honest, I'm not the KPI guy. That's not, I'm not the one you talk to about that, right? And I'm very frank about that. I am the context person. And I've spent a lot of time looking at online conversations lately, primarily on LinkedIn, about measuring value, quantifying value of enablement, and easily 90% or more of them are fixated purely on the KPIs, mm -hmm. on the measurement or the measurement framework. But the thing is that none, all of that only comes to life and has a chance of helping you promote your practice and save your job and save your team's job if the context is there. And that context actually gets established way back at the start of your practice. Mm. And then it gets consistently maintained and clarified and adjusted in alignment with the business unit leaders that you support. That's where I can contribute in the conversation is what is that context and what does it take to actually put it in place and keep it in place? Because I really do believe to my core that without it, you don't have a fighting chance no matter how good your data is. Mm -hmm. And also the, the skills and the personality traits and the decisions that it takes for an enabler to do the work of that alignment are the things that are probably hardest for most of us to do. Um, that, I'm right there with you. I, <laughs> I, um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to get it. We're going to dig in a little more on that. Cause I, I think this is a topic that needs to be unpacked further. Um, yeah. So Let's let's a lot of enablement professionals fall into the trap of focusing a lot on onboarding and that ends up they end up getting lumped into like the training group, right? Sure. You see that all the time. Yeah. You even see people outside of enablement say, Oh yeah, they're the trainers. And it's like, eh, man, we do that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a little bit, but there's much more. So now that there's a recession happening or whatever, yeah. you're not onboarding a lot of new reps, your yeah. your perception has changed now, I think in a good way. I think people are now starting to understand, oh, maybe enablement is more than just onboarding because we're not onboarding people anymore. <laughs> yeah. And we need them, right? Yeah. But so how how does your function in enablement change now that there isn't a lot of onboarding happen? What does that day-to-day -day practice look like? And and to kind of use your own language, yeah. what is that story you're now having to tell that is maybe different than the story you're telling or the context you're giving? when onboarding sure. is the main component? Sure, so to answer the question about what enablement can be beyond onboarding, the first two things that come to mind are reskilling. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have shifts in your workforce, there might be some people that are moved from one role to another for any number of business reasons, yep. right? So there's gonna be a need for reskilling. Um, also a lot of companies, because of the difficulties of extracting revenue from this market, they are adjusting their go-to-market approach. 
that requires new types of messaging, new types of training, and new types of engagement with buyers. Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind is reskilling in ways that support business movements internally. The second thing that comes to mind is workforce productivity. A, a good mm -hmm. specific example of that is conversation intelligence. So call recording, AI scoring, and then coaching on top of that from manager to rep. Yes. So there is a lot that enablement does that goes beyond onboarding. Um, another, but another, um, I think value prop for onboarding internally is the promotion path from BDR or SDR into account executive role because BDRs and SDRs get paid less. Yeah. So it costs a company less to promote them into an account executive role if they show the skill set yeah. than it does for them to hire externally an experienced account executive. So I think we're going to see a lot of companies that are not already doing that motion, doing that motion a lot more for cost reasons. And when you're doing that, it's more important than even, in my opinion, than external hire onboarding to get that right. Because that person has to not only learn their new role, they have to also step out of whatever assumptions gathered around the company, the product, et cetera, and relearn their context. Totally. That is not something that is necessarily an obvious skill for everybody, but it's something that enablers happen to be experts at. Man, that's a really good example. And it's something I've obviously experienced in my career early on. I've seen it a thousand yeah. times. Just because you're a good SDR doesn't mean you're automatically going to be a good AE. And yeah. candidly, just because you're a good growth or you know SMB AE doesn't mean you're going to be a good enterprise AE, right? Exactly. Yeah. So there is a lot of that retooling and upskilling mm -hmm. and unlearning. I think yeah. that that definitely is a part of it. So that's I, I really yeah. like that take. It's very interesting. Ooh, and I'll add one more. Here's another value play for anybody. Who yeah. knows. Um, if your organization is responding to the market by redefining and revisiting the, the skill profiles for the individual roles within the organizations that you enable, that's an opportunity to, again, call out your value. Anytime they're changing the understanding of the role and the behavior that is going to be necessary, enablement has an opportunity to make a contribution. Bingo. So those are some things. And this is one of my sort of guiding principles is that change brings opportunity. Yeah. It brings a lot of crap with it too. <laughs> and it brings True. a lot of stress. That's going to happen. And a lot it's of cursing, yeah. but change also brings opportunity. And I think those of us who can see it um, start to express the business leadership capabilities that are so critical to the first thing that I was saying that we're definitely going to get into. Um, and let's just, let's just dive into that now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. So when I talk about building that business context, those business agreements between the enablement leadership and but in this case, let's just say we're talking about sales enablement for expediency in the conversation. Uh, whether your enablement team is organized within the sales organization or not, if you're sales enablement, you are accountable to sales leadership, right? And this is true regardless of where your individual role is is organized as well. You know, right. I'm sure that there are many enablement leaders here who have a global mandate, but are organized under a regional sales leader. Oof. Right off the bat, you're screwed. Brutal. I'm sorry. Like yep. you have global expectations with regional authority and influence. So that's, that's one thing to diagnose about your situation, if that's what you're in. Um, it, but the thing is this, regardless of where you're organized, what your title is, who you report to, any of that, the truth is, that there has to be an understanding of the way that you are going to merge and uh, compromise on the differences between what enablement is capable of and what revenue is capable of. And I can only just tell the story of how I did it. Um, yes, please do. So I interviewed probably with 15 or 14 different companies before I interviewed for and, and, and got the role that I have now. And so I was able to learn along the way kind of what I needed to ask and how I needed to ask it to actually suss out if the person I was going to report to was reasonable. Mm -hmm. That's the matter. That is, that is the thing I look for more than anything else in a senior sales leader is, are you reasonable or do you expect me to work by magic? And I, I'm not being hy hyperbolic. I mean, actual magic. Like I live in the land of time and space. I live in the <laughs> land of cost and effect and cost and payment, right? But a lot of leaders work in the land of magic. And that's just not for Some me. Some of these and sales quotas out there. 
right? <laughs> I want to find that out before I sign up to work somewhere. Totally. So anyway, in the conversation with the CRO who I report to, he was my hiring manager and I, I could not praise my current CRO enough. Um, I said, I said, tell me what you actually expect. Like, tell me literally, what do you expect of enablement and what do you think enablement does? Because I want to know if this person's going to answer in terms of revenue KPIs or if they're going to talk about behavior. That's the first thing I'm looking for. Mm. It's just, I, I listen to, I don't, I listen to what the answers are, but I more listen to what type of information Sorry. are they talking about? If the first things out of their mouth are revenue KPIs, that's going to lead me down the conversation in one way. If it's behavior, it's going to go down the other way. Let's say it's revenue KPIs that came out of that person's mouth. Then I would say, oh, that's interesting. Why do you expect uh, enablement to directly generate revenue? Love and I just wait for them to answer the question, right? And there's a couple of reasons why I'm doing this. I obviously want to find out this person's perspective, but also I want to give them an impression, a taste of what it's going to be like to work with me. And these are exactly the kinds of questions I'm going to ask them. I'm going to require them to bring me business reasoning. And if they can't do that, I'm, I don't have anything to work with. And what I'm trying to get to is this, like any other business unit, there are things that enablement is built to do and not built to do, not because we choose not to, but because we're just not built for it. Mm -hmm. We're not a revenue generating function. You might expect us to, ex to generate revenue directly and we never will. That's, that's the facts. There's no magic there. That's the facts. Also, you know, we, our skill set is to impact behavior. And I want to know if the person I'm going to be reporting to in the sales business line understands that and is willing to accept that. If they're not, I won't work with them yep. because that's going to make my life miserable. And eventually I will lose my job yep. for, not, for not working by magic. Now, this is probably, and I understand why it is, but this is probably the greatest area where enablers need to grow, in my opinion, is business leadership skills. We are learning experts. We are wonderful helpers, but I don't know if that many of us have actually been mentored as business leaders and or also have just been given the opportunity to develop the just the straight up guts to have that kind of conversation, to mm -hmm. ask a, a senior leader in revenue, what's the business reasoning for that? And to sit and wait for the answer. Yeah. And I understand why I'm very empathetic to all of us because, you know, up until what the last five, seven, maybe 10 years at most, enablement as we know it didn't exist. Yep. It, was, it was probably the previous version of this was uh, learning or training. And before training. that it was learning and development. Yep. But what happened is that this last shift, this last evolution in the last five to seven years, one of the biggest changes was that enablement teams got reorganized out of um, like HR, HR employee experience learning and organized a lot of us directly into the business unit that we support. Um, so you had people who are prone to accommodation because that's our, that's our magic power. That's our special skill. And now you're reporting directly to people who are not prone to accommodation. Right. And, and so, it, and it's not a skill set that ever got meaningfully addressed as a top priority for enablement leaders. And so I am only fortunate that I spent a lot of my career outside of enablement. And even though I'm not naturally bold, um, I'm naturally mouthy <laughs> and expressive, but I'm not naturally bold. I was surrounded by a lot of leaders, incredible women, incredible men, and everyone in between who were fantastic, strong business leaders. And so they just imbued into me the knowledge of how to do it. And then I just had to choose. When the yeah. time came, I had to realize, you know what? I just got to gather up my spine and have these conversations. And so I do it to protect my team, honestly, more than anything else. That's where my motivation, I also yeah, do, it's like, honestly, call. it's fun. It's fun. It's for me, I'll speak only for myself. It's fun to have a collaborative conversation with a, a sales leader who I revere and feel like I can actually do this. I can contribute to their business. I can stand toe to toe with this person. I can disagree. I can scrap if I need to. That's fun. Yeah, it's empowering. It didn't. It didn't always feel like fun to me. I had to learn it. <laughs> yeah. But now it's fun, 
And um, it's also rock bottom essential. I, I keep kind of circling the point. I'm going to make the point here. The point is that if they don't know what to expect from you, they will expect whatever they want. Checklist. And because there is no consensus from even company to company on, on what enablement is and is not, where it's organized, who does it, how it's funded, all that stuff, you cannot ever assume that the people that are going to make decisions about your team and your job and your practice see things the way you do. And the other reason is this, because of the fundamental difference between a cost center and a revenue generating organization, you must come to a philosophical acceptance of the fact that the best you are ever going to get in quantifying the impact of enablement on revenue is a correlation yep, no between causation. skills growth measurement and growth in the revenue KPIs that those skills are fundamental to achieving. And I know there's a lot of perspectives on that. That one's mine. That's also the basis of the entire success that I have in my practice right now, because my CRO from that first interview, knows. he answered in behavioral answers when I asked him that question. And that's why I knew it was worth a conversation. Bill, so that was the most home run conversation I've had in a very long time. That mm -hmm. It, it just resonates on a lot of levels. Like I, I could, I could go on and on and on. A, you sound like a lot of your job, at least those, those early days was very sales driven, sales related in that you're negotiating. We talked about this. Somebody brought this up, uh, shameless plug for the enablement road show that we did in uh -huh. Boston, um, coming to Atlanta in a couple of weeks, someone brought up this concept of negotiating with their uh -huh. CRO. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. And mm -hmm. you just described it eloquently, which was there are things that we can do and should do. And there are things that we cannot and should not be doing. But if you adapt this persona of being all things at any time, whenever, whenever anything is needed, you're just the go-to project person, you end up doing everything. Yes. Oh my and gosh. You up, yes. You end up being seen. And we heard this, I heard this probably a year and a half ago when yeah. I would just go and talk to enablement leaders and just say like, what's going on? Like we're, we were trying to figure out like, where does GT and buddy fit and whatever. And I was just saying, what's going on. And I kept hearing this concept of, I feel like I'm just doing a bunch of random acts of enablement. Yeah. And I was like, no strategy, no. And here's the thing. That's it. It's not that just there's no strategy. There's no boundaries. Yeah. If you talk to me for more than 10 minutes, we're going to talk about boundaries. So here we go. I love a boundary. Boundaries are the key to my happiness in my life, in my work. Because again, I don't work by magic and uh, nobody else does. I, as much as I would love to be Harry Potter, I'm not. Um, I was hired to found the practice. So I was the first one to actually build it as a business function. And up to before that point, you could say, yeah, they were doing random acts of enablement. So I just... I do everything by common sense, honestly. And I think maybe because I didn't spend the previous parts of my career in enablement, I don't carry with me a lot of the assumptions. Um, and also because I'm a certified project manager, for years I've been practicing the skill of questioning my assumptions. That's mm -hmm. a key project manager practice. I'm not great at it, but I at least remember to do it. Do so, it. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, okay, well, they've never had an enablement function before. So no one's ever told them what enablement does and does not do. And if I don't do that, they're just going to expect me to do what they expect me to do. But I don't want to have conversations I don't want to have. Yeah. I want, and, and I thought, you know, every other business unit gets to have things they do and do not do. Enablement is no different. Yep. The only difference is whether the enabler in charge has established those boundaries or not. So I put together a five slide business plan. And I, for the first six months, Anytime I had a new audience, I trotted that thing out. And what it did is it said, hey, this is who enablement is. This is how we're organized. This is what we do. Here's our strategy for the full year, subject to change. Um, and this is the best way to approach us. Now, there was no slide saying, don't ask me to do this. That was the implication. That yep. was the subtext. Yeah. And I establish boundaries around my practice because the thing that enablers are best at is educating and, and upskilling. And so I'm like, I'm going to educate my stakeholders on what they should and should not expect from an enablement practice. 
And that business plan and strategy was always aligned on with my CRO before I ever did anything with it. I actually aligned on it up through the CEO as well. So I, there was no room for, for question. That was the first thing. You have to establish boundaries or else you will be treated as a free-for-all and a dumping ground. And what boundaries do is they increase clarity. Oh, yeah. And so for your value to be seen in the proper light, it must be clear how what you do aligns with what the business needs from you. The context allows you to achieve that. The other thing is this, you mentioned I sound like a salesperson. So here's the truth. I've sold in every role I've ever had, but I've not had an official sales role. Yep. And I was really actually very kind of nervous about that when I first interviewed with Dan. And so it was one of the very first things I said in our first conversation. I said, you've read my resume. You know, I've never officially had a sales role. Is that okay with you? And he's like, yeah, that's okay with me because I'm looking for some, you don't, you don't have to have had a sales role to have the skill set." But one of the big ways that I keep the alignment and maintain the boundaries and, and clarify the value around my team and my practice and I, is I speak the language of the business. And it's just the same logic as if you're selling, if you use the buyer's words and their references and their, their frame, you know, their approach to thinking, you're much more likely to win the deal. This is something that I think enablers have a lot of room to grow in. The people who you are serving, who you are seeking to be seen as valuable by, think in terms of business. They do not think in terms of learning and skills development. And season. yeah. And they are our customers. So we need to serve our customers. And so I always speak the language of the business. Two key ways I do that. I am constantly selling. And my default mode is value selling or solution selling. I am constantly discovering What's their perspective? What do they need? Mm -hmm. I'm negotiating with them. I'm clarifying the value prop, getting the timeline. I'm doing all of it. Partly because, you know, modeling is the best form of teaching human adults anyway. Yep, true. So if I want to, if I want to raise my seller's skill level, why not model those skill, sales skills every day with any one of them? I don't care if it's Dan, my CRO, or if it's a rep, I'm going to model that behavior. Yep. Um, but it also allows them to see themselves and what I'm saying and align with my logic and my arguments. A good example of this is classic enabler problem. Attendance is down. Wah, wah. Nobody's coming to my sessions, right? Now, my personal thing, I don't take attendance. I don't like taking attendance because if I'm taking attendance, it means I have to take attendance and that sucks. I don't want to fix that problem by making a checklist and going into compliance territory. Thank God. I want to fix it by selling. Yep. So here's an example. Um, we have, there are some sessions that weren't getting good attendance. And so I thought, well, who's going to drive that for me best? Team managers. So on a manager call, I presented the following. I said, roughly X number of sellers should be attending these sessions X number of times a year. And here's a really rough back of the napkin calculation of what it costs for one hour of labor for our salesperson on our team globally. And this means that when you do all that math, here is you know, several hundred thousand dollars of financial impact that's yep. getting spent on that time. Here's how it's actually being utilized, which is less than 50% of that financial impact is actually being utilized in the way that it means. And I said, look, this is not cash, I get it, yep. but this is negative financial impact. And I did, I said, every time we get this low level of attendance for this session, here's the amount of money that you're essentially setting on fire. It's not cash, but it's negative financial impact. Now think about how many deals do you have to close to fill this pit? Mm -hmm. I said, you're, just, you're just digging the hole deeper for our business, which eventually will make your life harder as a seller and a sales manager. Yep. And I said, also, let me just roll this up annually. And again, it was several hundred thousand dollars of negative yeah. financial impact. So could I have shown them an attendance report and told them, here's why my content is valuable and here's why you should come because of what it's going to do for you? Yeah, I could have done that. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to speak their language. And I said, here are the numbers. And here is how you and your team's behavior is making your job of selling harder for you. Mm-hmm. I, um, I've been saying it for 
probably over a year now, like screaming it from the rooftops. I'm just waiting for somebody to like make a t-shirt out of it. Sales managers are the linchpin for all of this shit to work. They are. As a sales rep, my entire career, I can tell you from experience, if my sales manager is not in, do not expect me to show up. Do not expect me to care because they are the person that I report to. They are the person that tells me what I have to do, what I don't have to do. They're the person that candidly kind of controls my job. Right? My yes. job is in their hands. Yes. And for an investor. I'm sorry, I cut you off. You're good. I was just saying I, they need to be invested for me to be invested. Yes. And for an enabler, especially those of us with a, a minimal or no tech stack to scale our learning experiences, the frontline team manager is our primary point of scale. They also happen to be the probably the most overburdened layer of oh. any sales organization. So their lives are already hard. Oh. Um, and my heart beats for them. I, if I had to pick my favorite role that I just want to take the most care of, it's going to be frontline managers all day long. Yeah, job sucks. It's tough. Not, only, not only because of how hard it is for them, but how critical they are to my practice. I literally cannot succeed without them. And so um, I totally agree with you. When you also add to the fact that a lot of organizations, because of the way they grew, um, they end up promoting their best reps to become their first official layer of frontline sales team managers. Horrible choice. Yep, they don't know what Classic they choice, but a horrible choice. They're sellers. <laughs> because there's just a different skill set mm -hmm. to a salespeople leader and a seller. Yep. The other thing that I think there's a lot of room for us to grow and enable, enablement can have a hand in this is that you know there's really no narrative that gives full respect to somebody who wants to be a lifelong individual contributor sales rep. Yeah. There's I know, not. I, I know a lot of them. Yeah. And they're incredible. Oh my gosh. Like, I wish I could sell like some of those people I know, yeah. you know? Um, and they are people who have, uh, through probably their own acumen and a lot of good mentoring, been able to make the distinction between what they want and what they don't want. Yep. And what path is going to be more meaningful to them. But they probably still had to resist a lot of that judgment that says, if you're still a rep after 35, there's something wrong with you. No, that is such a lie. It's just that we haven't provided mm -hmm. a meaningful narrative that says, if you are, if you are happy and if you are bringing in dollars, like a, like a, just a mad person, why would we want to pull you out of that and make you a manager? Yeah, so true. Phil, I can tell I can, and we'll, I'll have one more question for you before we uh, wrap. Um, cause yeah. we could talk, we could literally talk for hours yeah. uh, and we will in San Diego, by the way. Yes, yes. Um, but one thing you, one thing is really clear about you that I can tell is that you actually do genuinely care about your salespeople, just salespeople in general. I can tell because our conversation has been 90% about the sales rep mm -hmm. yeah. and a lot of enablers that I talk to, that's not necessarily the case. Not blaming them, not finger pointing them by any means, not saying that they're bad at enablement. Sure. Just saying it, it's very clear to me that you understand that the seller is your customer mm -hmm. and you really, really care about your customer and you want to know everything about your customer and you know what you want to know what they struggle with. And even just the example you gave, like some sales reps don't want to be in management, they want to be ICs. Yeah. Not all enablement leaders even know that, yeah. right? But you clearly have your hand on the pulse. I think that is huge. I think that's a really, really important thing. Um, and so I just wanted to tell you that because I could tell. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, totally. That's it's it's really clear. Mm -hmm. Um, so one one last question for you. Um, a little more, I guess, like tactical for those who are maybe like in a position where they're looking for a new role. You've led the witness a little bit in some scenarios. I think I know some of the answers to this question, okay. but if I am a new enabler, yeah, and I'm or maybe even experienced one actually, candidly, and I'm looking for a new role right mm -hmm. now. And I'm out interviewing. Yeah. I'm having conversations with companies. What are some of the things that I should be looking for as possible red flags? Like, eh, maybe not necessarily that I want to stay away from this company, but I definitely need sure. to ask some questions Yeah. Um, versus what are some of the things that you're like, yes, that is a company you definitely want to work for. Got it. I think the two most valuable areas to explore when you are um, interviewing for any enablement role in this market are scale and data. And I would strongly encourage you to ask questions about what is your tech stack? What is mm. your enablement tech stack? 
right? And you want to pay attention to not necessarily the names, but what are the functions that those tools are currently used, currently serving? Mm. Um, Oh. Because a lot of those tools do a lot of different things. And a lot of those different things relate to different levels of maturity. So here's an example. If they are only using it for knowledge delivery, that would probably be a red flag. Um, if they are currently using it for call recording and AI scoring and coaching, that's going to be a green light for me. Yeah. Um, because also that's going to indicate to me a level of maturity about the sales leader and the sales execution function that I'm going to be supporting. Yeah. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out how do you, what do, what do you have in place through which I can scale active learning and workforce productivity? Because if you don't have meaningful answers to that, you will absolutely get stuck in the knowledge transfer mode and you will absolutely be judged as insufficient eventually. So it is, again, enablers, you don't have to work by magic, but if the only thing they can offer you is something you know is gonna be insufficient to prove your value, you don't wanna work there. As far as data, you need to ask them specifically, what are, like, what are the behavioral measurement KPIs that you have in place? If they don't have any, you need to suggest some and ask them if they can accept that. Mm -hmm. And you also need to find out if they have tools in place that can actually produce that data. Because one of my favorite phrases to say uh, when I need to is, hey, I'm happy to have you measure me once you buy me a ruler. I like that. So those, so scale and data, super important. Um, here's the other thing. You really got to suss out if the person you're talking to is reasonable, specifically the people that you're reporting to are reasonable. Um, and if they're willing to change their structure when you find things that don't make sense. Perfect example. You have me with a global mandate, but I'm going to report to the America's regional VP of sales. Help me understand how that works and just ask them for an explanation. Regardless of what they say, you are going to have to say, I'm really, I really am interested in this, but I'm gonna need one of two things. I'm gonna need a regional mandate with regional support, or I'm gonna need global support with a global mandate. So if you want me to keep the global mandate, which is what I want, I'm gonna to need to report to the CRO. Make that a part of your negotiation. Mm -hmm. Because if you have, a if you have expectations that are bigger than your area of authority or influence, you will eventually fail. Here's the last thing I'll say. I know that the seat at the table is always a big conversation and that's what I've just talked about, right? Yep. If, you, if you don't have access, regular access to the thinking and, and business planning of the business leaders that you serve, here's my favorite way around that conversation or actually in that conversation to scrap if I need to. They say, oh, well, yeah, you don't need to report to the CRO. You know, your, your regional director will be your pathway and they'll tell you what you need to know. I would say this, okay, well, let me ask you this. When you're signing a deal and you're trying to find out if it's qualified, if it actually has a chance of success, and what you found out was that you could never actually gain access to the economic buyer and the executive sponsor, would you, would you think that that deal was sufficiently qualified? Would you expect it to succeed? And of course, the answer is going to be no. And so I would say, well, then why do you expect my practice to succeed if I can't gain access to my economic buyers and my executive sponsors? So good. So those are some things that you, you need to look for. Um, Very good. Phil, this was awesome. Again, we could keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> Great time. We'll save it for another session, maybe down the road, uh, maybe a different topic. We'll pick something and get you on again. Okay. Um, Again, I'm excited to connect in person in a couple yes. of weeks. Awesome. Um, in the meantime, how can people find you? Where are you at? Any speaking engagements? Like, feel free to kind of promote yourself sure. and people can follow you and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. LinkedIn is the, is the best place to, to find me. Search for my name, Phil Putnam. Look at my face. You'll find me easily <laughs> um, out of all the other Phil Putnams in the search results. Um, I love engaging on there. So don't be shy. And then, yeah, I am speaking at the um, Sales Enablement Society experience in San, excuse me, in San Diego, California. That's October 2nd through 4th. Ooh. And then I'm keynoting at the Sales Enablement Collective Regional Conference in Chicago on November 15th. Awesome. So if you're in those places, go check it out. Go, uh, go see Phil in person, connect with Phil. Yeah. Oh, 
Um, yeah. You know. And also I do coaching as well. So if you're somebody who's looking for a coach, especially if you're an enabler, who's just trying to figure out how do I, what do I do? Like, how do I navigate all this crap around me, whether you have a job or not, and you want to benefit from some, some coaching, feel free to reach out to me as well. Awesome. Phil, you're the best. Thanks for coming on again. Excited to meet you in person soon. Nice. And uh, again, we're going to have you on uh, another topic at some point. I would love that. Thanks, Will. Have a great day. Awesome. You too. Bye-bye.